This is Public Occurrences, both foreign and domestic. And now your host, Michael O'Fallon. I was born into an ethnically mixed family in Miami, Florida, back in the tumultuous year of 1968. On my father's side of the family, my abuelo and abuelo had come into the United States from Cuba, with my father being born in Guantanamo. Spanish was my Cuban side's primary language, and depending on where we were that day in Miami, the Spanish language was the normative. My abuelo was an architectural engineer spending many years working hard in Miami. On the other hand, my mother's side of the family was born from the line of families that came from the Pilgrims of Plymouth. They were farmers and teachers with a high sense of priority on literature and history. I grew up in Miami being a kid who was, at many times, one of the only kids that had very light skin, which was the combination of my mother's English side of the family combined with the weird mix of Spanish, French, and Irish on my Cuban side. To say the least, I'm a bit of a curious case of someone who really didn't fit into everyone's typical boxes of race or ethnicity when filling out the required forms for school or for surveys. In many ways, I am a rather inconvenient minority. But not a minority, depending on what situations and crowds that I find myself in. Oddly enough, my wife's side of the family is completely 100% Chinese. But my wife, who was born in the new territory of China, is fully American. My wife loves the United States and its liberties more than anyone that I know. Anyone around my wife knows this. It also means that there are many times that I find myself as the only non-Chinese person in rooms with hundreds of people. And I really don't care. And most of the time, I really wouldn't even think about it if it weren't for one of my Chinese cousins or nephews reminding me that I was the only Anglo-looking person in the room. You see, because I really don't care. And yes, there have been times where I have had to prove myself over the past 30 years with my Chinese side of the family. You know, ethically Chinese people have many stereotypes that they apply to people who are white or Hispanic. So it has been an opportunity to prove myself to challenge myself, and for me, to show who I am. These have been opportunities to demonstrate what I am about, who I am, and how I can contribute to the family. Because we are family. Sometimes we are more family than my own biological family. And for the most part, those in my family on our Chinese side are amongst the most patriotic people you would ever meet on earth. This brings me to an article that we published a few months ago on our sister site, New Discourses, by Kenny Zhu. And in this article, Mr. Zhu explains that my Chinese family, who are hardworking, industrious, studious, and success-minded, they're looked at as white-adjacent. Not because they are white, or because of their skin tone. Not because they have the same cultural background as many of those who are considered white. But because they strive to succeed in the system of our nation that is meritorious. Because for the most part, they are very thankful for the opportunity to be in the United States. They understand that the nation that is the most responsible for Asian hate is China. Again, let me say that one more time. They understand that the nation that is the most responsible for Asian hate globally, and also within its own borders, is China. They understand this. And this is what Kenny Zhu reveals in his fantastic article. So I'm going to read some of what Mr. Zhu states and interact this morning with his article. Mr. Zhu states this, and I quote, 
Critical race theory often justifies Asian discrimination because Asian Americans are often on the wrong side of the groups who need to be helped debate. One of today's most vexing Supreme Court cases is Students for Fair Admissions versus Harvard, which has brought anti-Asian discrimination to the forefront of the current cultural discourse. SFFA, which is Students for Fair Admissions, contends that Harvard's race-conscious admissions process violates the Constitution by disadvantaging Asian American applicants based upon their race, while Harvard argues that campus diversity goals justify their race-based process. Most of the reasoning behind Harvard's admission process comes from critical race theory, a theory of race which originated with Harvard University. Another hot topic recently, critical race theory, teaches that America is divided into privileged and oppressed groups based on race. Negative aspects of modern society follow from that dichotomy, and the only way to fix it is to revolutionize the way we think about race, culture, and society. Under the critical race framework, white supremacy covers a lot of different phenomena. Everything from blatant discrimination to the existence of English grammar to choosing not to riot are included under the term. And in the words of social justice activist and author Ibram X. Kendi, the only remedy to racist discrimination is anti-racist discrimination. In other words, the only remedy to past discrimination is present discrimination. The only remedy to present discrimination is future discrimination. In order to combat white supremacy, however broadly defined, critical race theorists view anti-racist discrimination as the only legitimate process. However, with the emergence of several racial groups that have come to be just as successful as whites, critical race theorists came up with the term white adjacency. Robin D'Angelo, author of the now infamous book White Fragility, defines it this way, quote, The closer you are to whiteness, the term often used is white adjacent, you're still going to experience racism. But there are going to be some benefits due to your perceived proximity to whiteness. The further away you are, the more intense the oppression's going to be. End quote. According to critical theorists, Asian Americans are the most white adjacent minority. They go so far as to say that Asians don't count as people of color, and even invented the term BIPOC, Black and Indigenous People of Color, specifically to exclude Asian and other white-adjacent minorities. Well, what does that mean? In my new book, An Inconvenient Minority, I tell the story of the many Asian Americans who are harmed by an ideology that penalizes their success. Progressives call out Asians for either trying to be like white people or by or benefiting from systems that prop up white dominance. Under critical race theory, it also means that they are complicit in upholding white supremacy. To be white adjacent is to benefit from the systems of oppression that America was allegedly founded upon. Applying the words of Kendi, then, means that Asians are a privileged group in which discrimination is justified to make room for the truly oppressed. But is the concept of white adjacency actually valid? In fact, white adjacency is simply a rhetorical tool to discriminate against Asian Americans. It's also an implicitly racist concept that devalues other races, meritocracy, and Asian culture. The idea of white adjacency hinges on the overwhelming success of Asian Americans in this country. It emerges from the fact that Asian Americans have the highest per capita income, lowest per capita crime rates, and the highest rates of college education. In fact, Asian Americans score better on average than whites on all of these variables. The problem is that critical race theory implicitly defines every good societal outcome as white. 
Even if your family came from China or India, being educated and achieving a high degree of personal success is deemed white behavior. This is racist in multiple ways. Obviously, it puts Asian Americans into a white adjacent box that completely ignores their unique cultures and struggles. Furthermore, it implies by default that other races aren't successful, talented, or educated. And I'm going to end quote there for just a moment, because right here is where Mr. Zhu really makes his point. We are allowing people to put us into categories according to our collective ethnicities, our collective cultures. And then they're trying to put stereotypes along with us in order to discriminate. And that doesn't matter if you're white, black, Asian, or Latino. Let me start again with Mr. Zhu. Quote, If being rich and successful are white characteristics, then doesn't the logic follow that being poor and lazy are black characteristics? Despite pretending to care about diversity and inclusion, critical race theory is actually racist in the way it implicitly categorizes groups of people. Asians are harmed from multiple directions by the white adjacent myth. Asian Americans have struggled in this country as well. Let us not forget the Chinese Exclusion Act or Japanese internment. Yet the concept is frequently used to silence Asian Americans when they attempt to explain their own struggles as a minority in America. It also gives universities such as Harvard the required justification to discriminate against Asian American applicants to their schools, who blow every other race out of the water academically. Asians are an inconvenient minority because their high performance is a threat to both prevailing woke narratives surrounding diversity and to be continued largely white ruling class hegemony in the Ivy League schools. As the coastal elite continue to double down on critical race theory, Asian Americans will continue to be the thorn in their side. Asian Americans are not deficient white people or white adjacent. They are unique individuals from distinct cultures, each with our own struggles and backgrounds. Their individual successes are theirs alone, and defining those successes as white is racist in myriads of ways. Asian Americans cannot simply be designated by critical race theory as a prop for white supremacy. We are the inconvenient minority. End quote. So as Mr. Zhu points out, when the woke diversity, equity, and inclusion specialists attach characteristics such as hard work, persistence, showing up on time, and being innovative as being attached to an ethnicity, because all of those good and worthy categories are being labeled as white, then we have a problem. Because these characteristics are valued in most Asian cultures, especially the Chinese. And because of these positive characteristics are valued by most Chinese families, they will succeed. And that isn't white. That is just what we all must do, regardless of our ethnic background or our skin color. And we should all reject victimhood. I'm Michael O'Fallon, and this has been Public Occurrences, Both Foreign and Domestic.